please be seated. And um, I'm going to, I always like to have a young person, one of our members, to come forward and share in the worship. So I'm going to have Braden come up and join me. We'll meet right in front of the, uh, over here. Anyone else? Please free, feel free to come up. And if so, bring, bring mom with, if you like. Have you been warm the last week? Uh, yes. yes. I think we all have been warm. It's been up to the 90s. Isn't that something? Yesterday it felt like we were standing in front of an oven with a door open with the wind. Remember? Couldn't believe it almost. It's been really a warm summer. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about heat because heat is involved in the making of bread. And today we're involved with reading about special bread that came down because of Jesus to us all. Not just once, but continues all the time. But in making bread and baking, there's a number of things that are involved. Not always pleasant things. I'm not talking about the mess it makes. But let's kind of think of ourselves as the ingredients that go into making bread. Okay? Have you watched how food is made at home? You ever stand in the kitchen? Sometimes you watch your mom. Yeah, I used to also. And, and after I had eaten what mom would, uh, would say, uh, you know, did you like the food? And I've always kind of regretted this, Raiden, because I never really said it was the most fantastic meal I've ever had. That's what she wanted to hear, but always it seemed like I said, it's okay. That was not the thing to say. Because I knew now, as I look back, all the hard work, it goes into making cookies and pies and breads. And this is cookie, well, more than that, it's pie season with all the nice berries coming out. So I bought a few tools from my kitchen and to share a little bit about what goes into making a meal. Now remember, a nice pie requires a lot of work. So first of all, you have to have something that's going to roll the dough flat, okay? Now, I have about eight of these. This is my favorite because you notice when I turn it, it still runs. I don't have to work too hard. But pity the dough because I'm going like this, and I'm going like this, I'm going like this, I'm going like this to get that nice, round, big piece of flat dough that fits into the pie. It takes a beating. Remember that. It takes a beating. Now, a lot of times, you know, when you buy flour, you're saying, well, this is really powdery stuff. But sometimes you have to sift it to make it even more powdery. So you're putting it in there like that, and you have a bowl underneath, and you're kind of going like this, you know. Okay. I mean, it's really kind of like a powder. Think about, this is really kind of a, look what it does. It just grinds up even more. It takes a beating. The, even the flour takes a beating. Um... A lot of times, when we mix the ingredients together, we need one of these, right? So you go on like this. Think about life. Sometimes when things aren't going really well in life, you feel like you're being stirred up, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, oh, give me a break. No, you just got to keep stirring it up because something good is going to come out of this, right? Got that. Then you got to use some, you, you have to use a, like a measuring cup of sort of type. So I've got uh, here for liters and I've got, you know, for the, all the rest whatever I want to make, and it's got to be really precise. So that takes time. You've got to measure it, you know, and pour it in carefully. And when you get that all together, you put it in the oven. Okay, you said it was really warm this week. Well, you've got to turn the oven on, which is like almost five times what it was this week, 90 degrees, huh? Maybe 400, maybe 375, maybe 425. That is hot. You know, life is like that. And then you would think, oh, no, how much can that pie take in there? It may take half an hour, 45, so then you use a timer. So all these things come into play in our own life as we try to sort things out and all the difficulties that come to us in life. Sometimes we feel the heat in life, don't we? Not just the temperature outside, but the pressures of maybe being a good boy, maybe helping out around the house. You feel the heat. Okay? And sometimes your life is kind of, oh, it's stirred up, you know. But after all this that goes into making a wonderful summer pie, and we eat it, and it is so good, 
but it sure took some work, didn't it? And the ingredients had to be stirred up, it had to be heated up, it had to be mixed up, it had to be siphoned, it had to be rolled out. And you know, we are like that in life. We really are. And out of the end, after everything is done, God gives us something that makes us all the better and happier in life. But we got to go through all the ingredients and all the mixture, all the heat, all the stirring, all the sifting. And wow, at the end, God comes through for us. Thank you. And maybe you'll have a chance to make a pie with mom this fall and maybe sooner this summer. All right? See you then. If any of you have a good recipe for pie, please pass it on to me. I looked in the Bethany cookbook, and there's some good recipes. I just found it this morning, by the way. Grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a summer for something to count on. I've said this, and I repeat it again. As I said earlier... We're going through a sabbatical. The church is looking at itself. Great opportunity. Wow. And it kind of reminds me of making a pie. <laughs> we have to stir things up within ourselves. We have to assess. We've got to measure and got to do things right. That's life, and that's wonderful. That's the way it should be. Because if improvement is to be made in our lives, we've got to shake things up, don't we? And then we've got to also settle and say, hey, God really came to us in a very bizarre way in the Old Testament with Moses and also in the New Testament with Christ as he came and bringing a, sh a shaking in our lives and society because he does it for the best for us. And we don't understand, just like the bread that came down, the manna from heaven, and they had something to eat. And they try to figure that one out as we still do to this very day. And we have the good news then of this gospel because it ties in with what we're doing here at Bethany this summer. We've had a wonderful vacation Bible school. The young people are on a journey mission. We had a fantastic big feed last Sunday in our church picnic. And Bethany is a safe place. Praise be to God. Surprises and more surprises is the message I want to leave with you today. And as we look in today's gospel, and this is just the fourth discourse in that sixth chapter, it takes a lot to eat this particular chapter and to swallow it and, and to get the nutrients out of it, if I can put it in that way. Because it deals also into second lesson today that Paul wrote in Ephesians about body, spirit, hope, faith, baptism, God, and Lord, all one down to heaven for us. It wasn't just a piece of bread or some kind of flat bread or what have you that was laying over the prairie at that time and people gathered it up. It was much more. And so with this then, we understand the true bread of life. All were fed. We heard about the lesson talking about the feeding of the 5,000. And a few days later, they come back for more. But they misinterpreted what God was really doing in his son Christ, that it's not just a handout and there's more to come, like an endless kitchen, but there was an understanding about who gave you this food and why was this food given to us? And exactly what is the bread? We can say, well, it was, as we can imagine, some kind of a flat bread laying here all over the fields. And people gather them up either by pint or liter according to our measurements today. You can only do so much. I've often wondered what it tasted like. I often wondered how much did you have to eat to feel, get your full or fill from the food. Jesus is the host and the guests simply need to request me is what he said. Come and ask. I have more for you. But it wasn't the bread. It was the understanding that something is going to take place in our life when we eat it. A slice of bread by itself really doesn't help us out. You can go through a whole loaf of Wonder Bread with nothing on it, and it still doesn't do anything for you. But what you put on that bread requires some labor and involvement to make it a deli sandwich. And I think the best way to understand this simple bread that was on the prairie and people picked up 
was that it was a kind of a beginning to a deli in life. What you experience, who you are, what you desire, what you're trying to get through in life, whatever is stirring your life up, whatever heat is coming into your life, all those things. And when you do that, you combine that, and you begin to eat it, you get nutrients out of it that you wouldn't have gotten by a single slice of bread in life. There's a lot more to what was laying around on the prairie when those people were picking this up and starting collecting it and eating it. But God wouldn't have it any other way that because I want you to have the very best which comes from me. You know, it's, life is more than bread. Life is all the experiences that we have with ourselves, with God. It may be like wrestling with God, as Jacob did. It may be living with others, as St. Paul did, to make the relevancy of Christ understood from town to town to town to town he went. And every congregation he dealt with was different, with different circumstances. And the beauty was that he could take that all and he could share the, the memories and the experience of teaching and learning with each church so that it all blended together and instead of one or two slices of plain bread, he had put everything imaginable to make life better by understanding our relationship with God and making the best deli sandwich you can find in the New Testament. All brought together. What a lovely chef he was. What a great cook he was. Those who sought after Jesus were simply under the influence of of the power of hunger. And that's understandable, we too. But they were bypassing God's immortal love. I often wondered how much sharing was done. You know, when you get a lot of free things, uh, all I got to do is re look back in my life when we had penny hunts during church picnics or other family picnics, a couple big bales of straw scattered everywhere, and then the men would take a bucket of pennies and throw in there and They'd say, okay, kids, go for it. And then we flew. We didn't just walk up to it. We dashed into that hay, and we picked it out. And we're competing with it. I found one. I found one. I found one. And when we had it, we held on to our pennies. Recall? So I often wondered what it was like when they were picking up the bread. Were they sharing it, or did they think, I'm going to keep it? I know I'm going to be hungry again tomorrow, and the day after, I'm making sure I get a whole lot for myself. That's the interesting thing. So our belief in God cannot be simply a feeding. It needs to be a smorgasbord of unimaginable doings that change our lives. <clears throat> what could that be? When we meet other people, when we live with our neighbors, or the people beyond our neighborhood, or beyond the borders of the country we live in, or within our own family, between brothers and sisters, between siblings and parents and grandparents. All we have to do is look at Downton Abbey and find out what life can be like. Not in the rich lane. We have to go to some other program for where we may be in that sense. Not what we do, but what God is doing to sustain and change us is the important thing. So when I say smorgasbord of unimaginable doings that change our life, I like variety, and if I'm ever going to grow or change, I want the best of everything, which is you and everybody else, and who you are, who you are, not what you are, that brightens my corner of life. Can't we all say that? How sweet it is to have variety in life. And to learn. There's one thing by going to a class and learning from a book. It's a whole other thing to living it in society and making it happen and grow. It becomes a smorgasbord of many delightful experiences in life. The manna in today's gospel, my friends, may be considered no more than simply an appetizer. It's just the beginning. Because when we seek on the smorgasbord of life, we shall find and we become more of what God would have us to become through experiences, some good, some bad, some in between, and it makes us who we are. 
All we have to do to see how things are going in our life as we get older, every morning when we look in the mirror, look into our eyes, and we see life and a life experience. Look into our face, and then go look at a picture of us when we were nine years old. But you know, as some say with good wine, age makes it great. So also with the years. And if we can feel that about ourselves, whatever we've experienced, whoever we are, God has really blessed us to make us his shining example because we've stayed the course in life. We dealt with the issues that came our way. We cried, we fretted, we worried, we had sleepless nights. You know, did Jesus have it any easier? In the three years of his ministry alone? He didn't last long, did he? But he stayed the course. It's amazing what you can do in life with the help of God. Paul expounds on all of this in highlighting the seven points of body, spirit, hope, faith, baptism, God, and Lord. All these are individual gifts of God, including God himself. He came to us. We didn't have to go knocking on the door to him. He was already there with the food, with the picnic, with the meal. And it all adds to the bond of peace because it's not just peace between ourselves and somebody else. It's the peace that we have within ourselves. As is often said, we are our own worst enemies. And when we're hard on ourselves, judgmental of ourselves, and we want to kick ourselves, and we're disappointed in ourselves, we become our own worst enemy. Before we can have peace in the world amongst one another and all people, we have to have peace in here. So he comes to give us peace. Not just a piece of bread to eat, but the promise of his presence. We're all one body that way. And the Spirit of God is that guarantee and pledge that we will all stand together. And that's the beauty of us gathered together on Sundays or other occasions in the Spirit and in the presence and the promise of Christ our Lord and Savior. And it goes beyond this wall to all people of all races, all nationalities who have the same feeling and the same hope. It's no easy matter to put this into implementation. There is a wonderful story, a number of books written by a Chinese author and theologian. He died in 1972. He spent the last 20 years of his life in a communist prison for his faith. His name was Watchman Nee. Some of you may be familiar with this. And he dealt with humility. And he told of a, a Christian brother in China, South China, who was filling his fields with water, and the fields were on hillsides, and his was above his neighbor's terrace, and down below was the irrigation. And the only way to get water up was hand pumping it in the field. Can you imagine that? Getting enough water. They must have had some kind of a screw drill that just rose the water up. When he filled his, his field, his neighbor down below was too lazy to do that, so he dug a ditch so the water from that field that he had pumped into came running down and filled his field. And this Chinese Christian understood that something had been done that was not right by the neighbor. So he repaired that ditch and he started again to fill it. And the neighbor did it again. This time after filling, and fi uh, filling in the ditch that had been broken on his field, he started by plumping water into his neighbor's field down below. Because this was after a lot of prayer and discourse with his fellow Christians. There's another way to do this without attacking your neighbor in any way whatsoever. So he filled up his neighbor's field first. Then he filled up his own field with water. The neighbor came and inquired, why did you do this? And he says, basically, our gifts from God are to be shared with one another. And the neighbor converted to Christianity, as Watchman Nee wrote it. You see, when we insist on our own rights, we're going to fail. But when we put our own rights aside and put our neighbor's interests before our own, we succeed. 
It's an unusual way, just as it is when God fed us with the manna from heaven on the prairie. Not quite how we think it should be done, but it does work in his way. Moses of the Old Testament, he was very strong. He stood before the Pharaoh. Let my people go, he said. But he didn't shake his fist at the Pharaoh. He didn't threat the Pharaoh. He was gentle to the Pharaoh. But before he could have been gentle, he had to submit to God's gentleness. The same for us. It takes time to be patient. And unfortunately, it often comes with pain and suffering. It's not uncommon for a preacher to hear, I do so lack patience, would you pray for me? And it's not uncommon for a preacher to say to somebody from Romans 5.3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, having that tribulation that works patience. It may not be the deli sandwich we want in life, with all the goodies and all the condiments, but when we withstand what is in front of us, the whipping that takes place in our life, the heat that we take, the baking of life. In the end, we see God's will being done, and we become someone new as he would have us each and all to be. This is what God does. He comes down to us like bread from heaven, and we're never the same afterwards when we eat of it. The lesson is hard, but you know, everything that he did both Jesus and what Paul wrote, really does work. It's like a recipe for making something special and something good. There's heat involved, there's a stirring involved, there's a siphoning that's involved, and a lot more. We know what the outcome is if we stay the course. Amen.